Uh, let's start with the, the, the big question. What is good acting to you? Oh, I think that's very simple uh, to say. Uh, it's not so simple to do. Good acting is acting that leaps across at you and takes hold of you and molds your response to a play and expands your understanding of a play. Good acting is acting that is satisfying and thrilling and memorable. And that could come from Bill Shatner in Star Trek or Edmund Keane in Richard III or Colin Fiore in... You never know where it's going to happen. And that's what's so exciting. So is there any parameters for good acting, or is it just as you say, it's just how someone is grabbed by it? I don't, th I think it's dangerous to make parameters, to make specifications, to make laws about it. It happens, it happens. Right. Um, not necessarily within a professional uh, context all the time. Good acting is good acting wherever you find it. Professionals, as I keep telling my students, are the ones who are able to repeat it accurately endless numbers of times. As I say, eight times a week and twice on Thursdays and Saturdays. That's a professional. Mm -hmm. Amateurs can do wonderful, wonderful work when circumstances are right when they feel good, when everybody else is working with them, when everything just coalesces. Wonderful work, but they can't be always reliable to do it the next day and the day after that. So are you saying good acting is whatever works? I've always said that. It's, the, it's, a, it's a damned pragmatic business. Whatever works is good. My, my wife's aunt loves CSI Miami and she loves the acting on it. To me, CSI Miami is uh, excretable. Yes, absolutely. Uh, oh yes, that's all just formula. But in our terms here, to her, yeah. that acting is good. Does that mean that's good acting? No, no, I wouldn't say that at all. I mean, I think we're talking, you and I are talking about good acting as we understand good acting because we have some, some understanding of the subject. Right. Yes, but no, no, obviously not. And how does good acting change with fashion and style and ages oh. and eras? I mean, Edmund Keane, yes. uh, or a 19th century actor, or an early 20th century actor, we look at them now, or we hear them on disc, yeah. or we look them back in white and think, oh my gosh, that's a bit. Yes. But to their audience, they were great. Absolutely, absolutely they were. And uh, I always have warned my first year students about that too, in first day of school. Um, what we think of as naturalism is a very, very different thing from what people called naturalism 20 years ago or 50 years ago. Naturalism keeps shifting with the times. I remember when I was uh, at Harvard um, going to a little cinema just off Harvard Square the, the Brattle Cinema. It specialized in vintage films, uh, the great old black and white films, and there was this one night they were playing The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, a wonderful film, in which Humphrey Bogart, uh, on his own after all of the vicissitudes of the plot, is starving, lost, and lying beside a fire and going slowly mad, thinking about the treasure that he has found and how he's going to get it back on his own and become rich. But he's quite clearly going mad. Humphrey Bogart playing a mad scene, staring into a fire. And I remember first seeing that when I was a very young kid and being very moved by it. And here was this 
whole audience of Harvard, I guess, undergraduates and some graduates in uh, the uh, early 60s, hollering with laughter at Humphrey Bogart. This was the funniest damn piece of ham acting they'd ever seen in their lives. Humphrey Bogart, what a lousy actor. So tell me about it. Was that something they're not seeing or that's something that Humphrey Bogart wasn't doing? No, I think he was doing brilliantly what he did. And it was very powerful when that film was made. It is powerful still. We've got past this now. But that audience was not used to that intensity of passion, that extremity of emotion that was coming out in that, in that scene. And his, his eyes would dilate. And I mean, he was, I mean, it was a very, it was an extreme close up and the whole face was there doing this wonderful thing with the fire playing on it. It was a marvelous scene. And what is it about our audience or this audience at Harvard that didn't want that breadth of dramatic energy? They weren't ready for that, that, uh, that extremity, that assault on their own sensibilities. They thought it was too much. Because that's their time or that's their upbringing? I I think it was the time. I think they didn't accept that people do that, that people are like that, that people can be like that. Nobody gets that crazy. So they hadn't been way. to the they hadn't been to the uh, the place for the mentally challenged. They hadn't people been to play people were oh, on no. drugs. They oh, hadn't been oh, to Lord, psychotic no. episodes. No. They just hadn't seen that in their lives. They hadn't seen anything like that. They hadn't seen that kind of acting. I mean, seeing it in life may be one thing, but they could they didn't. They, they wouldn't accept that an actor could go that far and reach them, or maybe they were so assaulted by it that they had to put up a blind. They had to save themselves from what they feared. <laughs>